Good morning. God is good, and I am loud. The message today was kind of, is this one on? It's kind of curious because I've looked back at ones that I've done in the past, which I do periodically, and this one was done in 2000. That's the one that God wants me to use today. So I hope that it touches the hearts that God means for it to touch as it touches mine and as it touches those who are seeking him. Let's ask for God's presence with us now. Dear Father in heaven, as we come before you now, I personally want to thank you for your promise to be here because I can't present this message without your help. Father, you can touch ears to hear the words that you want them to hear as opposed to the feeble attempt that I will present. So I pray, Father, that each of us will feel your presence, hear your voice speaking, and be convicted as appropriate, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, how I love Jesus. How often do you say that? I must admit, I'm a busy man. I have lots of things to say. And a lot of times those things that I say are not with regard to God. But even at that, the thought should be in my heart that I love God. I love Jesus. I love what he's done for me. I love what he wants to do for me. And I want others to know that. Not just that I love him, but that he loves them as well. So let's turn to the book of 1 John. Chapter 4, which was our scripture reading for this morning. And I have many, many scriptures today, so keep your Bible handy. 1 John, chapter 4. Verse 9 and 10. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into this world that we might live through him. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. The message this morning is called From the Heart. We see in this scripture right here that God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. And as John 3.16 says, that we should believe in him, that we should not perish. In Romans, the fifth chapter, if you would turn there quickly. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Some of you may be able to quote it without turning there. But just so that I don't misspeak, which sometimes I do. I will turn there and read it. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us. How does he do that? In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
Why did Christ die for us? Because he loved us. The Bible tells us in these verses that we've read that God has it in his heart to save us from certain destruction. He wants us to be with him, and so he needs us to understand why he does what he does. He needs us to receive from his heart the desires for our own salvation. He needs for us to, to recognize that we might desire our salvation, but he wants us to desire the salvation for others as well. So what is in our hearts that we can give to God, that we can give to each other, and that we can give to the world? I would suggest that because of God's love for us, we should be able to be sincere in making a statement with John in 1 John 4.19. 1 John 4.19. John says, We love him because he first loved us. Without God, we wouldn't know what love is, would we? Without God, we would we would know only unhappiness. We would know only fear. We would know only the, the future is unknown. But we can know that God loves us. We can also know to some degree whether or not we love God. But in the Bible, God gives us warnings. A warning that if we think something, we need to double check. Because Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, verse 9 tells us, the heart is deceitful. It's deceitful above all things, and it's desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know, that last part, the question where, where it says, who can know it, makes me wary that I know what I really feel, that I know what's really going on in my life and in my heart. Sometimes I say something thinking it's the right thing to say, and it turns out not to be. Sometimes I think that I'm right. And my family will tell you I'm not. My heart deceives me sometimes. I think sometimes also that we really set out to know God. We really seek Him and what He wants for us. We really even think we're doing his will at times. But things get in our way. We're headed in this path. We're, we're setting our eyes on Christ. We are walking along and we get distracted. Brad mentioned walking along and music triggers something. We all have triggers. And we're not the one who always pulls the trigger. You see, Satan knows what those triggers are. He has millennia of experience that we don't. And he has abilities to analyze us and, and 
pull out those things which will trip us up. And we are vulnerable to that. We take our eyes off of Jesus. But the Bible has a response and an answer for that. Turn with me to John the 14th chapter. Verse 6. John 14, 6. If we lose our way... If Satan trips us up or detours us, Jesus says this. Jesus saith unto them and to us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except by me. When trials come, where do we go? This brings me back to the question of what's in my heart. There's a song I remember growing up. I don't remember all the words. I don't even remember the title. But there's one part of the song that says, where could I go but to the Lord? And that's why Jesus describes it this way. He knew that we would, would mess up. He knew that we would fail and falter. And quite frankly, he warned us that this would happen. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 29. God's foreknowledge is really a blessing to us. Because while we may be surprised about things that arise in our lives, God's never surprised. He knows ahead of time what's going to happen. And if we study his word, we also too can know what's going to happen. We may not know the details, but we will be able to, to recognize where to go for the answers. Now, God knew we would lose our, our way. We would lose sight of him. And he warns us in Isaiah, the 29th chapter, verse 13 of this. He says, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. God says our hearts don't always remain where they should be. Sometimes we listen to men. Sometimes we take the teachings of men for truth. And our hearts will depart from God. What does that mean, that our hearts will depart from God, that our hearts will be removed far from God? That's a question that I want us to think about as we're going through this discussion this morning. Now let's move over to Ezekiel, the 33rd chapter. Ezekiel is an intriguing person. And there's some things about Ezekiel that maybe we just gloss over when we read the book. But I want to bring some of those things out today. Ezekiel, the 33rd chapter. God is describing to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, I want you to be a watchman on the tower. I want you to look out for 
those things that will be harmful to my people. And I want you to warn them. You know, a watchman is someone who stands on the wall or in the tower and they watch for trials. They watch for invaders. They watch for enemies coming to, as the Bible says, steal, kill, and destroy. And so Ezekiel is chosen at this time for this message to the people of God because they've not listened so far. Because God sent them messenger after messenger after messenger. And their hearts have been drawn away from God. Like a lot of us, the warning messages are given due to the choices that people make. The enemy is always going to be there. But it's up to us and how we deal with that enemy. It's up to us on whether or not we say, okay, I can deal with this. I can do this apart from God. Jesus, though, gave this message to Ezekiel describing a way to escape sin, a way to overcome sin. So we'll start with verse 11 of chapter 33, and we'll revisit this same chapter here for a little bit. Chapter 11, I mean, pardon me, 33, verse 11. Say unto them, and this is the people that the message of God is going to, which, again, includes me. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the good people. That's a true statement, you know. But that's not what God's saying here. He says, I have no... I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? God says, you have wicked hearts. You are evil, but you don't have to be. He says, turn away from that. Because why would you want to die? The prophets had warned literal Israel for many years that if they persisted in their wicked ways, destruction was sure. Ezekiel was living in a time of the fulfillment of those promises. He was actually taken captive to Babylon. Now, Babylon had taken exiles from Jerusalem and brought them to their kingdom in different waves. And Ezekiel was in that second wave. Now, God's message to Ezekiel is one of hope as well as one of warning. Shortly after the, the discussion in verse 11 about God not wanting the, the wicked to die because he wants them to turn away from their sins, we go to verse 21. And in verse 21, we, we see a message from someone other than God. It says... And it came to pass in the twelfth year of our captivity, in the tenth month, in the fifth day of the month, that one that had escaped out of Jerusalem came to me, saying, The city is smitten. 
In other words, he's coming to tell Ezekiel, judgment has come. The city is smitten. One would think that you have, would have a change of mind when you hear that the judgment is there. How many of you remember, some of us it's harder because we're not close to children anymore, but how many of you remember when you were a child, when you knew you had done something inappropriate, and you're caught, it's, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We pretend to turn away from our wickedness into this, into this repentant wannabe saint. You know, we, we can read the Bible and we can recognize that that's available to us, but if we look at our own history and we're honest about it, we don't always do that. Let's, let's move farther along here in, in chapter 33 of Ezekiel, starting with verse 30. God is going to give Ezekiel a prophecy about himself. But I want us to, to take these words in and then see where we can go with it. Verse 30 says, Also thou son of man, the children of thy people, he's talking to Ezekiel, with regard to the children of Israel, he says, Also thou son of man, the children of thy people are still talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses and speak one to another, every one to his brother saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. And they come unto thee as people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice, and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do not do them. And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come, then shall they know that a prophet has been among them. I, I mentioned that Ezekiel is a, an interesting person. He is called the Son of Man. When I hear that, because I've read Ezekiel, I, I might think of Ezekiel. But if I had never read Ezekiel before, I might think of someone else. So who else would you think of as the Son of Man? Well, if, if you want to know a scripture to answer that question, I have one for you. Because a lot of times when we're asked a question, we can, we can quote the Bible, but can we prove it? Where does it say that in the Bible? So mark this down. If you want to know who the Son of Man is, look in the book of Luke, the 22nd chapter, verse 29. Pardon me, verse 69. Luke Chapter 22, verse 69. Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, 
Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Jesus is speaking of himself here. So while God's talking to Ezekiel, calling him the Son of Man, Jesus himself is the Son of Man. So maybe then Ezekiel is understanding that there's something important that God's giving him to tell others. So let's see. Jesus was the Son of Man. What's the next part? Um, Ezekiel, God tells Ezekiel, Thy people are talking against thee. Still, they're talking against thee. Who else in the Bible did the people talk against? Um, let's go to John, the sixth chapter. And we'll look at verses 41 through 43. You will see a pattern here, of course. Because the Bible has lots of patterns. John 6, 41 through 43 says, The Jews then murmured at him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not amongst yourselves. So Jesus tells Ezekiel, the, your people are talking against you. And we see the same thing happening to Jesus, right? We see the people murmuring against Jesus because he said, I came down from heaven. What else can we glean from Ezekiel? Let's see. And they hear thy words, but they will not do them. Since we're into this pattern, did they do that to Jesus as well? Did they hear his words and not do them? Let's see. How about, let's staying here in verse, in chapter 6. Due to time, I won't read the whole passage, but... I would hope that maybe you will go back and read it. John chapter 6, verses 48 through 66. It's quite a, quite a passage here. Starting in verse 48, Jesus says, I am that bread of life. He had already described to them that he was the bread that came down from heaven. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, there's the Son of Man again, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And then I'll jump down to verse 61. When Jesus knew that when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth the flesh, profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus spoke words of life. He spoke 
the words that we need, that the people he was speaking to needed. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, did they believe him? God told Ezekiel, they won't believe you. You'll speak these words, but they won't believe you. But, he said, in the end, they will know that there has been a prophet amongst them. When Jesus died, did people recognize who he was? Some. But even today, people question who Jesus was. Jesus gave them the words of life. Did people recognize that eventually? Romans chapter 14 verse 11. When God said that the people will know that there has been a prophet among them, he was indicating that they would confess that this message came from God. They would confess that this was a true prophet. They would confess that there was a prophet among them. Romans, the 14th chapter, verse 11 says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess of God. We typically apply this verse when Jesus comes down, takes his people to heaven, there's a thousand years of judgment, and then he comes back down again and resurrects the wicked dead. At this point, we recognize that every knee shall bow, even Satan, and will confess the justice of Jesus, will confess the truth they will confess that there was that prophet. And we call Jesus a prophet here because Moses himself said that there will come a prophet like unto me. One who could speak face to face with God, but in this situation who himself was God. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was and will be confessed. Just as Ezekiel had said, it will come to pass. You've seen the scriptures here that describe the fulfillment of the prophecies, but there's a more poignant story that we are familiar with as well. You see, there was that time when Jesus was coming to Jerusalem and he told his disciples, go to this place in town, and there will, you'll find a donkey. And the donkey has a colt. Bring it to me. And if the owner says, what are you doing? Say, the master hath need of it. So here's Jesus. He's riding on the colt of a donkey. By the way, Luke 19.38 tells us about that. And he is saying nothing. He's just riding into the city. But people have gathered because they know he's coming. And they have laid in the 
in the roadway, palm branches and, and garments and, and all of these kinds of things. And they have this idea that this is something special. That God has sent a king. And they say in that verse, Luke 19, 38, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. They're worshiping him with their mouth and with their lips. Sound familiar? In a matter of a few days, these same people, at least some of these same people, I'm pretty confident that not all of them, but some of these same people are crying out, crucify him, crucify him. They worship with their mouth and their lips, but their hearts are far away. It makes me think about my own heart. It makes me think about being here this morning on Sabbath and worshiping God, singing songs, saying, oh, how I love Jesus. But when I'm not here, what's my heart like? Do I get easily offended? Do I get bored and want something fun to do? Do I get tired and take shortcuts on my work or whatever, whether it's schoolwork or work work? I'm, I'm sure that most of you have heard the statement that history repeats itself. We've already seen the story in Ezekiel where Ezekiel would prophesy and the people would not listen, where some of them would come say, let's go listen to him. He's, he's like, a, like a good singer, like a, a great musician. He's got words that, that sound good. But then they didn't listen to them. We see the same thing with Jesus as we've gone through. Jesus was someone to see. He was performing miracles. He was doing all of these things. And yet, their words really meant nothing when they worshipped him. They were just as likely to say crucify him as they were to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, I can say crucify him as well. And I'm not alone. Many people daily cry out with their actions, crucify him. We don't care about him. He's not my king. Caesar is my king. What's in your heart? Earlier the question was asked, and I, I, I mentioned that you should think about this as we go through this conversation. But the question was asked, What does it mean that their hearts are far away from God? I believe if we listen to the Holy Spirit, if we accept his conviction, 
that we will know what it means for our hearts to be far away. He's been speaking to me more strongly than ever. He's been describing to me the things that need to change in my life. When I slip up, it hurts more now than it used to. When I do those things that I know hurts God, it hurts me. But I go back and remember that there's a way that I can become whole with Jesus again. He doesn't want my half hearted praise. He doesn't want my obedience without my heart, if you can really even do that. David said in Psalm 51, 17. Now Psalm 51 was written after David's great sin with Bathsheba. Let's go ahead and turn there. Psalm 51, and we'll look at verse 17. When we think of God... We think of happiness more often than not. And yet, we see another side to God. Psalm 51 verse 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise this. Why is it that God would want a broken heart? Why is it that he would want a contrite heart? Well, if I think back about this specifically, and I look at Jeremiah where he talks about the state of my heart and how it's desperately wicked, how can I, how can I do anything but die? My heart is wicked. But David says, I can give you that heart. And both the books of Jeremiah and Ezekiel will tell us that God will give us a new heart. When something breaks, would you prefer to try to tape it up and fix it up so that it might work a little bit longer? Or would you rather have a brand new one? I tell you, rather than try to sew the sole back on my shoe, I would rather have a new pair. Rather than 
having an old, broken, worn down, wicked heart. I would rather have a brand new one. No more jealousy. No more pride. No more hatred. Unfortunately, that list can go on as well. God wants our heart. He wants us to come with our whole heart. With God, it's nothing if it's not all. The way we typically say that or is all or nothing with God. In Matthew, the 11th chapter, verse 28, again, this is a familiar scripture. It says, as Jesus invites us, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So, tell me if this concept is right or wrong. I have this heavy load on my back. I've been carrying it a long time. God says, come to me and I'll give you rest. So I can go to him and I can get rest to carry my load with me farther along. What's wrong with that? God wants to take the burden. That's where the rest comes from. I don't know about you, but when I have a big project due, I'm pretty confident that it's most of you going to school still, that you know you have a big paper due the next week. There is a burden on your back. How good does it feel when that burden is complete, gone? So I asked the question, does it mean that we can get that rest from God and still carry our burden? And the resounding answer that I didn't really hear is no. Remember, God says, I have no pleasure. God wants pleasure. He created us to have pleasure. Just not the kind that the world pretends is from God. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Now, in the world today, sometimes I might suggest that it's even a badge of honor to admit that I'm a sinner. How humble you are to admit that you're a, somber, a sinner. But if I said to someone, instead of saying, I am a sinner, I said, I am wicked. That's a different thing now. Isn't it? <laughs> I see that. Wickedness and sinfulness are the same thing. It's just the time we live in. And how we can paint over those bad sounding things 
and make it sound not so bad. I mean, we all know that Christ came to forgive sinners. But did he come to forgive wicked people? Well, we already know that answer too because we read it in Ezekiel where he says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but they will turn from their ways. If we have any sin in us, we are joined with those who are declared wicked. Now I must admit, some people have taken that term to, to mean something good. When someone does something amazing, they say, that's wicked. Satan does that with us. Satan turns things around where we can think that good is bad. The Bible tells us that. People will believe a lie, the Bible tells us. There's good news, though. For those of us who are wicked, and that word's coming to me a lot lately. For those of us who are wicked, there is a way out. We don't have to remain in that place. Jesus gave his life that I might turn away from my wicked ways and gain life. When God wants something to be remembered, to be emphasized, he a lot of times says it twice. Let's go back to Ezekiel thirty-three eleven. We read this already, but we want to emphasize a different part of it now. We emphasized previously that God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Now we want to emphasize the part where it talks about how you can get away from being in that position of the wicked that will be destroyed and die. Verse 11 again says, Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Now here it is. Turn ye, turn ye. From your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? Who is the house of Israel? We are. Turn away. Turn away. Again, it has to be all the way. We cannot turn part way away. We have been told to repent and be baptized. So let's see, how does this work? Have you gone all the way? Have you repented and be, been baptized? Or were you just baptized without the repentance? That's a pointed question for us each individually to, to consider. Or maybe you've repented and just haven't been baptized.
Are you thinking? Are you thinking of what baptism are you talking about? That baptism. Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you are born again, unless you are baptized of the water and the spirit, you shall not see the kingdom. So maybe we've repented. We've been baptized. Oh, by the way, the Bible tells us Paul met a group of men who were studying the Bible, and he said, have you been baptized of the Spirit? And their answer was, we don't even know if there is a Spirit. So Paul explained everything, and they were ready to be baptized by the Spirit. Not just born of the water, but by the fire as well. In Testimonies, Volume 2, page 262, it states this. And this, brings it to us in words that I couldn't even think to say. It states, many profess to be on the Lord's side, but they are not. The weight of all their actions is on Satan's side. By what means shall we determine whose side we are on? Who has the heart? With whom are our thoughts? Upon whom do we love to converse? Who has our warmest affections and our best energies? If we are on the Lord's side, our thoughts are with Him. And our sweetest Thoughts are of him. We have no friendship with the world. We have consecrated all that we have and are to him. We long to bear his image. Breathe his spirit. Do his will and please him in all things. Sobering thought. What are our conversations about? How often do I come to my family in the evening and say, You'll never guess what Jesus did for me today. How long, how often I should say, does it come at work where someone gives me a compliment and I say, praise God? Because I deserve no compliments. What do I think about when someone does me wrong? Can I praise God in that situation? It's a sobering thought. I know that in the Laodicean church that we belong to. We don't have to be a part of it, quite frankly. We can be a part of God's true church. But this Laodicean period that we live in, I would believe that there are some 
who will take these statements and suggest, yep, those people are exactly like that. In fact, I might even say that. Not knowing that I'm the one who's blind and naked and wretched. In essence, God is telling me, let me include you all, because I don't want to be alone in this. God is telling us that we have praised him with our mouths, but where are our hearts? Are they far from him? Or have we given them to him? He says, if we really love him, we will keep his commandments. John 14, 15. And that means whatsoever I have commanded you. Matthew 28, 20. Since we're talking about Matthew, let's go to the the 22nd chapter of Matthew really quickly. I know that I am running long. That happens when you have a lot of Bible scriptures. <laughs> I won't blame you. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. Jesus is responding to a question from a, a lawyer here. And Jesus says in verse 37, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. There's that all or nothing thing again. This is the first and great commandment, God says. And the second is likened to the first. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Did you ever think about the situation that we have been given the ability to love? Or did you think that's just a natural thing? A baby's born, they automatically love their parents, right? A child grows up, they automatically love their parents. It's not automatic. But God puts it there and gives us the ability and the capability to love. If we couldn't love, he wouldn't have told us to do it. But he does qualify what that love is. We've already understood that we're to love with all our hearts, minds, soul, strength. But let's go back to 1 John, the fourth chapter again. Now we've read one of these verses and we read some of these verses in our Sabbath school this morning. I was getting concerned that it was going to go a direction that I would have to repeat. 1 John chapter 4 verse 7 and we'll go through 11 and then we'll jump over to verse 19 and 20. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God it's not our natural. Love is of God. Everyone that... I'm having a hard time not singing this verse. Many of you know the song. 
Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also, help me out, to love one another. Remember, that's the second commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. It wasn't our idea. It was God's plan. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. John's not holding back here. Let me not hold back. He that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? John fifteen thirteen says, Greater man hath no love than this, that he does what? Lay down his life for his friend. It's so easy to see Jesus in that passage, right? But is that passage speaking of Jesus or us? You can go ahead and say the answer is yes. Jesus already did it. Are we willing to do that? We don't have time to go into what, what that means. How do we lay down our lives for our friends. Something to think about. Something to study. Can we really love like this? I can. And I know you can. Because all of God's biddings are enablings. We all have this morning the opportunity to choose life. Remember, turn ye, turn ye, choose life. We all have that opportunity to say that we choose life because God says, why will you die, O house of Israel? And I say this morning because we're not guaranteed that we're going to have another morning. We're not guaranteed that we're going to have an evening today even. Let that sink in. Are you invincible? I'm not. Otherwise, I could stand here and say I'm a righteous man. I am not invincible. And I don't have time to waste. God wants me in his kingdom. God wants you in his kingdom. You don't have time to waste either. We recognize 
Hebrews 3, 14 and 15 says, For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. While it is said, Today, not, you did this yesterday, so you're okay. Not tomorrow. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as they did in the provocation. The provocation was when the children of Israel wouldn't go into the promised land. We have a promised land. How do we get there? Let's determine today to put away anything between us and God. To put away anything between us and our brothers or sisters. Will you give your heart to Jesus right now? Maybe you have already. We praise God for that. Thanksgiving is coming up formally in five days. Will you be able to thank God for a new heart? A new perspective, a new sight. You know, every day should be colored with our thanksgiving. Let's imagine what our hearts will be like when they're fully and wholly given to his only son who died for us. Let's think about that. Not just today, but tomorrow and the day after. If you want to give your heart to Christ, let's stand. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us your heart in your Son, Jesus, who died for us. Father, may your Holy Spirit convict us and convert us. May he come into our hearts and give us that new heart that you have promised. May he put your law in our hearts that we will walk in your statutes. And Father, may we surrender all to you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.